Major support for these programs is provided by Bank of America Merrill Lynch and Perfect Building Maintenance, New York Community Bank, Kilroy Architectural Windows, New York's window company, Greenberg Traurig, LLP, m and Bank, Chase Commercial Term Lending. Additional support is provided by Briarwood Organization, Bruce Mosler, Capital One Bank, Cassidy Turley, C.B. Richard Ellis, Chelsea Lighting, Cushman and Wakefield, Dime Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Douglaston Development, DDG Partners, Hal Fetner, Durst Fetner Residential, Friedman LLP, Accountants and Advisors, Gemini Real Estate Advisors, LLC, Genova Burns and Gian Tomasi, Investors Bank, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Center at Syracuse University, James Orfanides, Centurion Holdings, Corman Communities, Madison Realty Capital, Margolin Weiner and Evans, LLP, Certified Public Accountants and Business Advisors, Massey Knackle Realty Services, Meridian Capital Group, Newmark Knight Frank, Sterling and Sterling, SJP Properties, Stonehenge Partners, The Wickoff Group, Urban American, and Ackman Ziff Real Estate, Aerial Property Advisors, Eastern Consolidated, Essex Capital Partners, Goldman Properties, Moynian Group, Must Development, RAL Development Services, The Spanville Group, LLC, Rosewood Realty Group, Terra CRG, Triangle Equities. So people are supposed to protect other people. And there are people out there who are people in the legal process called criminal attorneys. There are people who take care of taking care of the underprivileged, perhaps, the people who have a high profile. But there is some, one of the leading criminal attorneys in the country is Jerry Sharp Gell, and he's my guest today. How are you doing, Michael? So, Jerry, you were, uh, you were born in New Jersey. You grew up... Uh, born and raised. B born and raised right in New Brunswick area. Yep. Y your dad uh, was in the paint supply business, yes, right? Yes, yes. He, he followed the second generation. You your grandfather was in that business. That's right. And uh, the, the interesting thing is you said you grew up in, in a section of New Brunswick, and then you moved to a small hamlet, which had some interesting criminal activities. What happened over there? Yeah, it, 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 it kind of piqued my interest in, in, in criminal law and following criminal stories, true crime stories. Uh, it turned out that we moved to, to a, a section of Franklin Township where back in 1921 or 1922 there was a famous murder, um, the minister and the choir singer murder, a, a prominent minister of the local church, mo most prominent church in New Brunswick, was having an affair with the wife of the sexton and uh, both of them were found in a lover's lane. Uh, the woman had her uh, throat slit, larynx removed, and, and uh, the and minister had been shot, and this was literally yards away from my house. And, they, and he left a business card the there? Bus the, the, the minister's business card was at his feet, lest any be, wouldn't be confused as to who it was. Now, you were saying, you know, some people grow up, you know, you, you, you really, you know, you, you want to idolize Babe Ruth or something. Something that you were growing up, and I, you know, we're, we're contemporaries. There was the famous Bostonian attorney, F. Lee, F. Lee Bailey. Bailey. Sure. You, you, sure. you loved F. Lee Bailey. Yeah. How do you get this desire for F. Lee Bailey and Kunstler? You were saying, well, I, you know, I, I uh, grew up admiring Babe Ruth and Lou Gehrig, but I, I, I also paid uh, close attention to the prominent trial orders of the, of the day. How? I mean, um, what, what? Just getting, reading the daily news, reading the tabloids, um, uh, really soaking up every word, every account, uh, every description of the trial. And, and, I, and I thought, uh, I'm not suggesting that my, that my thoughts were fully formed at that time. I had other interests as well, other possibilities. But uh, um, I really thought the idea of standing before a jury and speaking on behalf of an accused was was really reaching the top, the pinnacle. 
Now you said to me, you know, your upbringing in New Brunswick was, you know, it was a suburban town. Your, your dad had the, the retail store over there. And then you get a job, you, um, you, you uh, I won't say you lied, you changed, you, you fibbed, and you, you get a job in, in this hotel in the, in the Lido Beach. And you were working out in Lido Beach in the summers. Tell me about it. was an eye-opening experience. If, any, if anyone has uh, seen the Flamingo Kid, I think for a period of time, I was the Flamingo Kid. I was 16 years old. I told the management no, the, I was No, the Flamingo 18. Kid was, he was running the, 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 the car, card games. Yeah, yeah. Okay, you know, but there's a, there, there are parallels there. Because what happened with the Flamingo Kid is what happened with me. And it was an eye-opening experience. There I was at this... Uh, a uh, fancy hotel, you know, uh, beyond anything that I'd ever Lido experienced. Beach hotel, this, this, yeah, this, but there were politicians, businessmen, gangsters. Bert Roberts, that's where Bert, you, Bert Roberts, the famous uh, Bert Roberts from that, the Bronx. Court. That, that's right, and and uh, uh, it was, as I said, an eye-opening experience. M met all kinds of people, and uh, knew th knew from that point on that I wanted to go back to New York, and I wanted to you know, live on a, on a bigger stage than Right, you than even told me the story that once you went to Atlantic Avenue with one of the cooks, and you, you, know, you don't even remember how you got back. So you go to Rutgers. Uh, your mother was a secretary at, working at... In the math department. In the math department over there. And Shrekel was not the best student in... in no, in, my proudest achievements in college were uh, uh, meeting my wife and finding her. And, right, she was and, at Douglas and, yeah, College. She was at Douglas College. Um, the second proudest moment was being the rush chairman of the fraternity. Uh, I, I, I worked throughout college, and uh, I liked the idea of becoming a, a, a bartender. That was that was uh, th these were among my accomplishments. But you know something? There is a there is a corollary I think between being a bartender and a trial lawyer. You have to tell a good story, and 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 uh, telling a good story is what both of those professions are about. Listening, listening, listening at the, over there, and telling a good story. So you graduate Rutgers, and since your grades weren't. Rush, Rush Chairman was more important over there. You got into Brooklyn Law School. I did. You get, the, and, and at this time you uh, you had met your wife already. Uh, you were, and she was. You were moving in Brooklyn, and it was the she was taking the remote commute, uh, the the opposite commute down to Jersey City, right? Because the tuition was a little better over there. Well, we were you know very astute investors, so New York City was paying. Uh, teachers. She actually was actually a speech therapist, and the salary in New York City was $5,600 a year. And the salary, listen to this, in 68? Jersey City was 6400 And it was worthwhile making that daily commute, as you said, a reverse commute going the other way for that, that extra $800. Now, the interesting thing is to supplement your your wife's uh, salary and you were going to law school, you went back to the bar on Friday nights. You were working. Every Friday night I was working the bar, working the stick, as they say and um, and uh, came home with a fair amount of money. It was a good paying job. Yeah, so now it's the second year. You know, people go, the clerk, the first year, you told me that you uh, you worked in the welfare department, yes. which you gained a lot of insight to the world of uh, the city and how welfare was given to everybody. Yes, yes, I, I was happy to participate in that effort. <laughs> <laughs> and the second year is more of the interesting year that you, you're, you have the opportunity, you see the legendary Paul Dwyer, right, in the courtroom? Well, going to Brooklyn Law School provides an, you know, an enormous opportunity, and the opportunity is that the school is situated right near the federal and state courthouses in, in Brooklyn. So uh, from the very beginning, from my first year, my interest, again, was, was in, in trial law, was reaffirmed when I would walk over to the courts just because that's what I wanted to see and walk into a courtroom and I think back to, to, to a trial. I remember the name of the defendant, Ernest Kidd Gallishaw. He was represented by Paul O'Dwyer, who had been with the the brogue, and the brogue, the white, white hair. hair. He was fabulous. He, he, it was beautiful, it was a beautiful thing. And to, what, what I learned from that, and I, and I, and I saw other lo iconic lawyers work after that. Uh, F. Lee Bailey, Maurice Edelbaum, uh, uh, Henry Singer, these were were, were just, just titans of the time. And, and uh, th th what I noticed is they controlled the courtroom. It was their room. And, and uh, they stage, seemed totally in right? control. It was absolutely, it was their stage. And I was so taken with that that I, I uh, uh, started to formulate the thought that, you know, this is something that I'd like to do. It really happened um, the, the second summer of, of my law school career, and when I got a job as an intern at the U.S. Attorney's Office. Well, you tell me that. That's very interesting. There's something about the dry cleaning and some other 
think it's well, it's an interesting story, and uh, and and I uh, oftentimes tell it to students that you know because luck counts, and and uh, fortuitous events can lead to uh, uh, progress and success, and uh, certainly it worked for me. Um, when I came to New York from New Jersey, I didn't know a lawyer. Um, I, at that you time, were the first one your parents didn't go to college. You no, were the first one who right. went to college. My mother went to a junior college, but my, yes, I was the first one to graduate with a bachelor's degree. And and uh, coming uh, coming to New York at that time, in order to get admitted to the bar, you had to be sponsored by a lawyer. And I would be sitting around thinking, you know, I was months or a couple of years away from graduating, but I was sitting around thinking, well, I, I don't know a lawyer. So uh, it turns out that uh, my wife's uncle, Uncle Milton, w had a dry cleaning establishment in Brooklyn. And he said to me one day when I, was tol I told him I was looking for a job for the summer, he said, you know, I know a judge, a, a judge in New York uh, uh, named Bobby Brownstein, and, and I talked to him, and he said, you should give him a call at 8.30 Sunday morning. Now I'm thinking, uh, I'm more nervous than with any case I ever tried because I should call a judge 8.30 on a Sunday morning. I did. He said, come to Chambers my next, the, the next day. And he was really keen on getting me a job. I mean, he was it, bursting with, I mean, he had a lot of things to do. People were in his chambers, people coming in, people going out, lawyers having conferences. I'm just sitting next to him watching all this. And, and, and uh, he had this keen interest in finding a job for me. Later, it turns out that I, that I think he had a, a huge dry cleaning bill <laughs> that he owed <laughs> Uncle Milton. So he wanted to satisfy Uncle Milton any way he could. So he called up the district attorney of uh, Kings Ca County, this uh, man named Aaron Kuda, and, and uh, he said, go on over and, and, and Mr. Kuda's gonna meet with you. Uh, well, my classmates were meeting with, you know, the fourth assistant, this district attorney who never went to court and, you know, was like the, the lowest rung of the ladder in the office doing these interviews for summer internships. But I went right to uh, the district attorney himself and he's giving me all the reasons. Hey, I, I was the rush chairman of the fraternity. You know, I, did, I knew the game. He's giving me all the reasons why I should come work there for the summer. I come back and I said, well, it seems that I'm hired, Judge. Uh, so so uh, it's, it's exciting, it's fabulous, thanks so much. And, and uh, he said, you know, I was thinking, you should be at the U.S. Attorney's Office. Gets on the phone, he calls Joe Hoey, then the United States Attorney for the Eastern District of New York. He said, I'm sending this kid over and give him a job. So Hoey tells him, well, wait a minute. You know, it's like, uh, it's, it's now it's like April and uh, jobs at the U.S. Attorney's Office were committed. A year before. Yeah, right. a year before, months before. It's impossible. Brownstein said, give him a job. I had the job 15 minutes later. I walked over there not even for an interview. It's, I, I was giving him my social security number and signing up for, to, to have this job. Um, it was a fabulous job, it was a fabulous summer because courts in, in those days would generally close for the summer. In that, in, in that year, it was 1968, there was a backlog of uh, cases that had been you know, on the docket for, for a year, two years, very old cases. Visiting judges came from all over the country to work all summer to, with, along with the Eastern District judges. At that time, there were only like eight, or, uh, eight of them. Uh, eight or eight or nine, and they were going to clean up the back calendar. So what, what I, the opportunity I had was to see ju uh, uh, not so much the judges, but all the lawyers from the New York area that that were the top criminal defense lawyers, and I watched their styles, and I watched and I and I watched how they handled witnesses, and uh, uh, that's the moment I knew that I, I wanted to be a trial lawyer. And that's how you met the Jimmy LaRosa. Yeah, because when I was a, I was an intern, I was assisting a, a lawyer, a very good prosecutor, who who later went on to become a Supreme Court justice in New York. Since died, John Leone is his, was his name, and and um, I was I interning for him and helping him prepare the case, doing the you know kind of uh, uh, ministerial jobs that, that that are attendant to a trial. And um, the defense lawyer was uh, Jim LaRosa, who became my mentor. And I looked over, and, I, and, and I'm sitting at the U.S. Attorney's table with, with the prosecutor, and I'm looking over at the defense lawyer, and I said, I'd rather be sitting at that table. That's where I belong. So even though I had the opportunity in those days, in the Eastern District anyway, you could go right from law school to the U.S. Attorney's office. Can't do that today. And, and um, I, I knew that I didn't want to be a prosecutor. I had no interest in putting anyone in prison. Um, I, I, my interest was in defending a person, to, to make sure the defendant was 
you know, got all the representation he needed and, and, and enjoyed all the rights he was entitled to. So by the end of that year, um, I, La, uh, La Rosa hired me first as a, a, you know, an assistant. I was still in law school as an, as, as an intern or an assistant in the office, a law student uh, just, you know, learning the game. And uh, the rest is history. I went on to, to join him after I graduated from law school. I um, was with him for seven years. I became his partner. partner. The name of the firm was La Rosa Shargell and Fischetti. Um, we tried some fabulous cases. Uh, it, was fa it was great to be a criminal lawyer, and I'll tell you why. Because in those days, think of the year, 1970 Organized Crime Control Act, wiretapping was, was coming around. RICO. The RICO statute was, was, was enacted. Um, these statutes uh, were, were um, uh, really being applied for the first time in the early 1970s. So it, was, it was the stage, it was the initial beginnings. Yeah, it was, and, and there were fabulous, you know, we lost most of them. RICO's still alive and well, and, but, but uh, it's interesting to, you know, to, to deal with those new issues of paramount importance was great. But what's really interesting, you know, when somebody hears the word criminal, you don't realize that criminal is any trial. And we were discussing this prior to the show, that, you know, as one people could say, white collar crime. You know, it's not, you know, crime is, is it's not, you know, organized crime, or it could be stock manipulation. It could be a variety of things. Uh, why do people have the perception of, of thinking criminal of someone who's a, an alleged gangster. What do you? What would you say? Why? Well, that you know that that's the issue about uh, distinguishing white collar crime from non white collar crime. Um, I, I I am I am emphatic in noting that I I, I don't want to I don't want to be thought of as a white collar lawyer. I don't want to be thought of I want to be thought of as a lawyer who represents people who need representation. I want to be thought of as 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 a lawyer who's willing to to give my all, you know, like they say, all in to represent the, the, the client. And, and, and I'm not said, worried about the color of the color. Right, the it's, it's the color. It could be white, blue, or uh, right. anything. That's right. And then th there's another point, I think, which comes out that, you know, there are lawyers and, uh, who, who, who really don't get to know their clients. And one of the things that you've said over, the, over your life and, and it's practiced in many of the articles is that you, you know your clients because you want to understand your client because if you understand your client better, you can defend them better. There's no question about that. You know, if you're, if you're uh, representing a, a someone, someone that's charged with a crime, it may be a professional gangster, it may, it may be an inside traitor, it may be, uh, you know, uh, uh, a pump and dump stock fraud uh, uh, defendant, but the fact is that that person is in for the fight of his life because uh, if he or she loses, um, there is a deprivation of liberty. If he or she loses, it's, it's catastrophic. It impacts not only on the defendant uh, herself, it also, it also impacts on the entire family, the future of children, you know, children who 20 years from now will be Googling their parents and so on and so forth. It, 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 is, it is a matter of monumental importance. How can I be a, you know, cold clinician who, um, you know, really doesn't want to uh, get to know the client, and, and, and if the client is uh, sometimes sometimes a client remains a client for for years, um, why why wouldn't I go to a wedding that I was invited to? Why wouldn't I a, a, a attend, a, you know, a, a, a funeral uh, where there's a death in, my, in a client's family? Why wouldn't I want to uh, feel close as we're in this very important battle together? You know, when you represent a client, you can't. You, it's not like you. You know, you take the facts, you make some notes on a pad, and then you say, well, I'll see you in now, court. Now, speaking yeah. of clients, I mean, yes. and we're going to talk about some interesting cases because over your lifetime, you've done some interesting cases. I mean, at one time, you represented the legendary John Gotti. Yes. Now, after you defended him, what was that case that you defended him and you, you, and you won? Because then later on, he had comments that were taped at the Ravenet Club, basically saying, "I'd, I'd like to get rid of Shargill permanently, right, uh, right, you know, and, right. and utilize the, right. the the cemetery for you." What was the case that you represented? Uh, I represented um, actually uh, Gotti's co-defendant, and and Bruce Cutler was there for John Gotti. We worked together as a team. 
uh, from that, the tabloids say, you know, represented Gotti because of his um, outsized personality. Um, so um, it, it, then it was after that case, it was an acquittal, there was a, a shooting involving, uh, it was a case involving a shooting of a member of the Carpenters Union, and um, the, he, was, he was, as his co-defendant was, completely acqu acquitted. He was heard saying those things on tape. But I, I knew John Gotti very well. I knew him for many, many years. Right. You went. He was, to, you went to the the prison afterwards. You know. Where yes, but before and after, and I, I knew him for. I knew him back in the you know back in the eighties. He has an operatic. He had an operatic way of speaking, um, in 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 large, grandiose uh, uh, terms. So what John Gotti said or was heard, you know, being said, what was heard being said on. On tape, uh, it really didn't bother me that much. No, no, but what it didn't was, bother me at all. Well, the interesting thing was the next case, which he then went to jail. That you were thrown off the case. That was that uh, the the judge said you were like house counsel, and that they were going to put you on the witness stand. They made yeah, they never did. And I was house counsel in 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 that year when I was disqualified. I'd been I'd been disqualified from a case in the 1980s because. Uh, because of the claim that I was house counsel to to this family or not, you know, I've represented a broad spectrum of uh, New York citizens, um, um, of mob members, gangs of every kind, uh, uh, white collar offenders of every kind. You know, but you know, you were defending a couple of years ago, and if Bernie Madoff didn't go to the, the situation, you really were defending someone. This guy, Mark Dreyer, I, have a, I had a friend, a dear friend, who got involved and became his partner. Nobody really became his partner. But this man was probably the best actor around. I mean, he, he talked everyone into believing this, this lie over the years. And I mean, and you defended him, and now there's even a, a film coming out. What's the film yeah, name? The, film, the name of the film is Unraveled. It's a, docu it's a documentary, or a, a more aptly, a cinema verite. Um, because it shows Mark Dreyer reflecting on his crime as he awaited after pleading guilty and, and uh, uh, waiting to be uh, sentenced. It was a fascinating case because Mark Dreyer was a, was a fascinating and complex uh, uh, person. Um, his reflect, the reflections, reflections on his own life were, were, were very interesting. I think people will find the movie very very interesting. Now you talk about in some of the articles and the discussion that you really followed in certain approaches uh, Martin Luther King, right? He's, uh, as Bono said, a hero of mine. Yes, I, I followed him. For, if I, first I, I followed him for practical reasons. I think he's the best orator um, in, 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 since uh, recordings have been made. Uh, you know, I, I, I can't tell you what Washington sounded like, and I can't tell you what Lincoln sounded like, but I know what Martin Luther King sounded like, and whether you're listening to his sermons or his, his uh, um, civil rights speeches, um, no, no one is more articulate. No one spoke with the cadence of rhythm. The iterations that he did were just uh, phenomenal, just absolutely phenomenal. Now, orating, part of your life is being in the courtroom. And you were saying to me that you sometimes, when you're preparing for a case, or, or you know, you, you, the preparation, you get up, you leave the house, and you want to go to the courthouse. And when you're in the courthouse, you feel comfortable. What do you mean by yeah, that? Yes, what I mean by it is this. Um, I have, uh, you know, there are times when I have an opening, an opening uh, statement or a closing argument in a high-profile case, and I know that it's going to be a packed courtroom or there's going to be a particularly important cross-examination that I have to do that's complicated, complex, or it's going to you know, take a lot of hard work. Um, I could be tightly wrapped just like anyone else and, and, and uptight you know, and, and in, in the morning as I'm getting dressed and thinking about this and thinking about that and making sure I have a complete handle and I've mastered the facts. and. And uh, then I go to the courtroom, and, I, and, and whether and, uh, I'm in, a, in Anchorage, Alaska, or the Brooklyn Federal Courthouse, or the Southern District, or you know, I've, I've tried cases all, all in different parts of the country, um, the courtroom just relaxes me. I walk into the courtroom, and it goes back to what I saw in 1968. The feeling inside is, this is my room. I am comfortable here. Um, 
sometimes you see civil practitioners who are litigators, but they rarely actually get to court and litigate anything. And you see three or you, four of them you're come in very you're all nervous in court. Uh, you know, I'm not you're, nervous in court. You're very comfortable going back to the school because you like teaching also, right? In some respect, that's, that's true. I mean, no, I, I mean in say, a different aspect. Well, I mean, different, well I, what I do say, you know, I, I have a, a classes at Brooklyn Law School, sometimes as large as 125 students in, in the class, and I've said to friends, it's a wonderful experience because you can get up in front of 125 people, and essentially it's like delivering a summation, and no one says guilty. You know? or, <laughs> so it's, it's, it's fabulous. Now, we were talking, and, you know, certain people think, you know, there was the Martha Stewart case, uh, you didn't represent Martha Stewart, I did not. but you handled someone else. Now, Martha Stewart made like a half a million dollars on, on the stock manipulation of Inclone, and then there was a doctor who was a Memorial Sloan. There was, the, there was a doctor at Sloan Kettering, and this is public record, who um, traded $5 million worth of Inclone stock on that same morning that Martha Stewart sold a relatively small um, uh, amount of, uh, of that stock. Um, and you know, it, it, it underscores the point that a lot of, a lot of success it, it comes from cases that are never hi, highly profiled, that are, that are, you know, that see, receive wide attention. No, but he but never he, went to jail. He never went to jail. He never, he, he never uh, was convicted of anything because um, there was a deferred prosecution. I was able to persuade uh, the, the the United States Attorney's Office in the Southern District that his work in cancer research is a wonderful man and a, and a highly competent, competent uh, uh, well-regarded uh, uh, in cancer research. And that I, I said that his cancer research, his ongoing cancer research, was far more important than putting another person in prison or prosecuting another person and, and detracting him for, for, from, you know, from his work. And, and uh, that argument was successful. And I'm, I'm very proud of that. Let's talk about family. You've been married for what, 40? Uh, in June, it'll be 45 years. 45 years. And you have. And I'm glad that I knew it, just like that. You, you better. And uh, you have two children, a I son have, and a daughter, correct? I Who have both? Two children. I have six grandchildren. I have but a wonderful daughter in law and a wonderful son in law. Let's talk about your daughter. She, uh, she changed. She was in the legal practice. She was, uh, it, she is in the legal practice. Uh, she's a graduate of. Uh, uh, Yale College and Yale Law School, and she um, recently left her firm to do uh, uh, to, to represent indigent people on appeal. She's an appellate specialist, and she's representing uh, indigent people. I'm very proud of her. And then your son? My son is a an associate at uh, the Bracewell firm, and uh, he's doing very well there. And it's a it's a, it's a great firm. It's a great uh, environment, and uh, I'm proud of both of them. So now, if you Growing up in, in New Jersey, do you think, uh, did you ever think you'd be who you are today, a criminal attorney? No, I, I, was, I was never a planner. I didn't, I, I didn't like plot out or, you know, and, uh, but, but any kind of career. But the key is, we said before. But, but the answer is no. But the key is, as you said to me before, when you go to a case, you have your thoughts, but the final decision of how you act Come spontaneous. That's right. Spontaneity is, is is crucially important. Okay. Thanks for being here today. You're welcome. Good seeing you.